Hey folks, welcome to the second part of the moving fluids lecture. Where we left off uh, with part one was um, learning that more fluid is pushed out of the capillaries during capillary exchange than can be moved back in. Um, and that would result in um, an excess of interstitial or tissue fluid. Um, which would be a, a big deal for, for many reasons that we're going to talk about. So that's where the lymphatic system comes into the picture with respect to the cardiovascular system. right? We've already talked about the um, ability of lacteals, which are tiny lymphatic capillaries, to absorb lipids in the small intestine. Um, Two weeks from now, we'll talk about the immune system and lymphatic organs, but today we're going to concentrate on the lymphatic system's role in absorbing excess tissue fluid um, and returning it to the bloodstream. So we're essentially going to be focused on the vessels of the lymphatic system. So when we talk about this system, um, there are vessel, two sort of major categories of structures of organs. Um, vessels and then more classic organs like the spleen, lymph nodes, the thymus gland, tonsils, for example. Lymph is fluid connective tissue, as is blood. Um, and the fluid, lymph is just the fluid inside lymphatic vessels. Um, it's formed by excess, the absorption of excess tissue fluid, which remember can also be called interstitial fluid. So this little diagram shows us that as capillary exchange takes place um, throughout the body, more water is pushed out of the capillary than can be returned. Anywhere from two to four liters per day of your, the water in your plasma becomes interstitial fluid. Now, if you remember that um, most people have between four and six, four to six liters of blood total, um, the loss of all of that fluid, in addition to making us sort of blow up and look like um, um, and in an inflated balloon, we would also um, have serious problems maintaining blood pressure because that in part depends on blood volume. So lymph is initially colorless when it's first absorbed, but eventually does become white. And that's because of the addition of white blood cells as the lymph moves through lymphatic organs. So lymphatic capillaries are, are quite different than cardiovascular system capillaries. We learned in the first part of this lecture that um, there's a sequence, uh, an unending sequence of blood vessels in our bodies. So you have arteries carrying blood away from the heart, which lead to arterioles, which lead to capillary beds, which lead to venules, which lead to veins, which go back to the heart which lead to arteries, and so on and so on. Lymphatic capillaries and the lymphatic vessels are really different um, in the sense that they have, that there's essentially a beginning and an end. And the vessels in this system begin with, oops, that's not showing up, with lymphatic capillaries. So these are, finger-like structures that are threaded through our capillary beds. And like vascular capillaries, remember vas means vessel, um, and vascular refers to blood vessels in particular. Um, so like vascular capillaries, lymphatic capillaries um, spread throughout our tissues come back together to form larger and larger vessels. Now, if we look at lymphatic capillaries super up close and personal, 
um, we see that they're very thin, so they are made of um, squamous epithelial cells. But unlike most vascular capillaries, these guys are quite leaky. Um, there are gaps between the cells. And that's quite useful because what it means is that excess tissue fluid, right, everything goes from where it's more concentrated or under more pressure to where it's less. Um, excess tissue fluid is easily going to enter through these gaps um, and into the lumen of the lymphatic capillaries, right? Lymphatic, larger lymphatic vessels, um, like veins, have valves. And whenever you see a valve, it's, it, all valves have a fairly particular job, and that is to prevent backflow, whether it's of a gas or of a liquid. The movement of lymph, lymph through lymphatic vessels is aided by these valves, but it also is aided by um, muscle tone and skeletal muscles because there's, there's uh, very little smooth muscle associated with lymphatic vessels. So unfortunately, this video isn't going to, little video isn't going to play in here, but essentially shows you that the lymphatic vessels are a completely separate set of piping that, um, that runs alongside our cardiovascular system. And that's also shown here. So one of the things that we'd like for you guys to be able to do is describe the flow of lymph through lymphatic vessels. Um, and it's a lot simpler than the flow of blood through the body because there's an actual beginning, which is um, with the lymphatic capillaries, and then there's an end, um, which are the veins, uh, the subclavian veins above the heart. So lymphatic capillaries come together to make smaller lymphatic vessels, which then um, pass into lymph nodes. Lymph flows out of a lymph node um, and goes through a chain of uh, lymph nodes in lymphatic vessels until eventually you get to the lymphatic ducts um, above the heart, which empty into the veins, the subclavian veins. Subclavian means um, under the, the clavicle. So what happens if you have a blockage of lymph drainage? Well, the technical name for this is lymphedema. Sometimes it's just called edema. Um, and that refers to swelling in tissues. That can result from um, a traumatic injury that interrupts the flow of lymph from one place to another, um, or pressure on lymphatic vessels from a tumor um, which I believe is the case in, in this upper image. Um, there's also um, a parasite that likes to live in lymphatic vessels. Um, it's transmitted through mosquito bites, um, although don't panic, not the kinds of mosquitoes um, that live around us at this point. Um, and that's what's happened to this poor gentleman. Um, this is called filariasis. <clears throat> Excuse me, and um, it can be quite painful and it's difficult to treat. So, while lymphatic capillaries, right, we talked about how there are these gaps between cells, and that then allows for the um, for the diffusion of liquid quite easily into the lumen of the lymphatic capillaries. There's a, a downside to that as well. Um, cancer cells, um, unlike most cells in our bodies, um, are often able to move on their own. They acquire that ability as they become cancerous. Um, and so the, they're perfectly capable of crawling through these 
openings into lymphatic capillaries. And once they're inside the lymphatic capillary, they go to lymph smaller lymph vessels. Um, those cells, once that lymph with the cancer cell passes through a lymph node, might be um, caught and attacked by the immune system. But if they're not, um, they essentially have a free ride, uh, sort of like a wolf in sheep's clothing, um, to other places in the body where they can set up shop. Um, and that allows cancer to spread. Okay, so the heart. Um, there's another groovy video I can't show you. These are um, cardiac myocytes um, from a newborn rat heart that were um, taken out and plated in cell culture. Um, and what this video illustrates is that uh, cardiac muscle cells are capable of spontaneous movement. Um, they don't require um, input from, on an individual level, they don't require input from the nervous system to contract. Oops, too fast. Okay, um, so the heart, um, if you started the lab for this week, you'll already know that the heart sits inside a double a bagged membrane, which is called the pericardium. Um, the pericardium is sort of, imagine it um, sort of like a water balloon that you fill. <coughs> that would be Mr. Spot. Sit down, buddy. So the pericardium is like a fluid-filled bag um, that the heart is, is sort of pressed down into. And um, it's a serous membrane, just like the peritoneum is. Um, it, the space in between the two sides of the pericardium is called the pericardial cavity. And that's filled with serous fluid, which remembers that thin lubricating fluid. The layer that's directly uh, um, attached to the surface of the heart is called the visceral pericardium, right? Viscera means organ. The parietal pericardium is the side cl uh, closer to the um, outside of the body. So the heart has a point on it, which is called the apex. Um, and the apex is pointed toward the left. Um, the heart's sort of tilted um, back with the, the apex um, pointing forward and to the left. What you see in these images are the, the coronary arteries. Um, the coronary arteries and the coronary veins, coronary blood vessels, supply the myocardium of the heart, the heart cardiac muscle of the heart, with oxygen and nutrients, and they remove waste. Um, the picture on the right is actually um, this huge dark structure is the largest artery, the aorta, um, and coming off of it are the coronary blood vessels, coronary arteries. Um, when somebody has a, a heart attack, which used to be called a coronary, it results from a blockage in the coronary arteries um, so that heart muscle is deprived of oxygen um, and so it actually, the muscle dies. I'm going to skip this slide because it's not a particularly great one. Um, the point of this is, again, just know that the blood vessels that serve the heart are the coronary arteries. So when we talk about um, the body of the heart, um, there are two atria, which are the upper thin-walled chambers, so less muscle, um, and they're divided by um, an interatrial septum or wall. And there are two ventricles, which are the thicker um, chambers at the bottom of the heart. Um, and they're separated by 
and inter interventricular septum. Septum's a general word for, for a wall. So you essentially have two separate pumping systems within the same organ, whose, and the function is um, function is uh, coordinated. So there are three layers to the wall of the heart. Um, we've already talked about one of them, um, just using different terms. So the epicardium, remember the prefix epi means above or on top of, um, is the um, outer layer of the heart, but it's made up of the visceral pericardium here, the pericardial space or pericardial cavity, and then the parietal pericardium and, the, and um, what's referred to as the fibrous pericardium, which helps to anchor it the heart. The middle layer of the heart from going from the outside in is called the myocardium and that's made of cardiac muscle. And then you have the endocardium which is a layer, um, one or more layers of epithelial cells. It's referred to as endothelium. So remember when we talked about the muscular system, we talked about um, cardiac muscle a little bit. What distinguishes cardiac muscle um, are the presence of intercalated discs um, that mechanically and electrically tie cells, the, the cardiac muscle cells together. Um, and also that the cells themselves have a branched anatomy. So in this um, in cartoon, right? This is a single cardiac muscle fiber. And there's the outside, right? Um, the intercalated discs are found in between the muscle cells. Um, single centrally located nu nucleus um, and then branches. And you can see in the up close view, um, the gap junctions between two different cells and the adhesive junctions. Also have our friend the mitochondria in here, powerhouse of the cell, and you can see some thick and thin filaments and a Z line right there. All right, so part three of this lecture is going to cover <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to cover the actual um, atria and ventricles and the valves in between them, as well as the path of blood through the heart.